ladies and gentlemen good morning good afternoon and uh, good evening we have people logging in from all across the globe thank you so much for joining this session hosted by bero uh, my name is shakti prasad i am the head of content at bero and i run the procurement espresso magazine i welcome you all to the webinar titled category management to drive uh, procurement success uh, before i get started with the session uh, just a few housekeeping rules to be kept in mind all the participants will be on uh, listen only mode for the entire duration of the webinar we will take up the questions at the end of the presentation but we would encourage our attendees to key in their questions any time during the session please uh type them into the question box uh, given in your control panel that could be a lag of a few seconds in between the transition of slides uh, so please bear with us uh, if you have any difficulty in joining the webinar uh, say if, if you're for some reason if the audio is not working or if the video feed is not working uh, please try to log back in or key in your queries in the q a box and my my team uh, will try to help you uh, now i'm happy to introduce uh, eric stavrand uh, seasoned category management expert. Uh, I hope you all can see Eric on your screens. Uh, before, <laughs> hi Eric. So before meeting Eric, uh, to be honest, uh, I didn't realize that um, category management uh, can be an interesting subject. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but Eric can effortlessly uh, weave case studies in order to drive home the point uh, that category management, if deployed correctly, can drive a business advantage. Uh, besides being a gifted speaker, he's also a gifted writer. He has previously published a book titled Global Procurement Leaders Handbook, uh, which I read and found it very useful. Now he has recently published another book titled Global Category Managers Handbook. You know, I, I have an announce, announcement to make on this. I will come to that shortly. Uh, now I, want, I would like to uh, introduce uh, uh, our fellow panelist, uh, Vail Kumar uh, Krishnan. Uh, Vail is the vice president of research uh, at Bero. I hope you all can see him on your screens. Uh, Vail is a, a veteran in the procurement intelligence space with over uh, 15 years of experience. Uh, he heads the digital practice at Bero and oversees the research output delivered via Bero's uh, flagship platform, uh, BeroLive.ai. And over all these years, uh, he has worked on nearly 10,000 projects uh, across uh, industries, uh, domains, and categories. Uh, thank you so much for joining the session today, uh, both Vail and Eric. Pleasure. Thank you. Oh, cool. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so, I, I mean, as I said, I have an announcement to make. Uh, Eric has uh, written this book, Global Category Managers Handbook. Uh, in fact, Vail had uh, uh, contributed to one of the chapters on market intelligence that is procurement intelligence so whale has contributed to this book uh, and uh, eric uh, has uh, published it i think a month ago uh, so uh, the announcement is uh, you know up to 500 500 attendees uh, who you know who are currently attending the webinar will receive a free copy of this book it's based on a lucky draw uh, we will be doing the draw sometime uh, this weekend. So if you are uh, the lucky winner of the lucky draw, you will receive a link to redeem the book. Uh, it's actually a Kindle book, so you'll be able to add it to your Kindle library. So you will hear from us very soon on this. So if you are selected, congratulations. Uh, the book is uh, yours to read. In case uh, you miss out on the lucky draw, uh, no worries. Uh, we will, uh, you know, ensure that you can buy the book at a very special price, not at the list price, but at a very special price. Uh, we will, of course, uh, communicate that to you uh, soon. Uh, anyway, so one of the main reasons why I've invited both Eric uh, and Vail Kumar uh, for this webinar is, you know, it's two things. So one is, of course, we're going to be talking about category management, but we, we will also be touching upon procurement uh, slash market intelligence here because, uh, Category management by its very nature is a strategic in nature. Uh, it, 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 it cannot be done on a daily tactical basis. Okay, let me do category management today, but let me not do it tomorrow. No, it doesn't work that way. It's a 
it's a long term plan that needs to be very carefully crafted and deployed and it's a bit intensive i would say uh, whereas the procurement intelligence uh, can be done both strategically as well as tactically so that's the beauty so procurement intelligence can be done uh, in a strategic manner as part of a category strategy and even as part of uh, category management however if you don't have category management and if you are you know forced to firefight uh, some of the uh, you know many of our colleagues are uh, facing that situation especially uh, during these difficult times uh, no worries uh, procurement intelligence is such that you know you can dip in and dip out uh, as and when you need it and then get the requisite information and data for example how do i get a better price how do i lock in the price how do i negotiate with the supplier so it can be done both tactically as well as strategically however we always recommend that it to be done strategically so that's one of the main reasons why i i'd invited both uh, eric and vail kumar to touch upon this subject which was not very discussed quite often i think i'm done with my uh, somewhat uh, lengthy introduction uh, eric and vail so let's move on uh, next slide please okay eric uh, let me start with you uh, category management uh, you know so this term is not new and it's been there for like 30 years 30 40 years and uh, you ask someone each one would come up with a, a their their own definition you know so to speak so what is category management and why do you think uh, it is more important than ever now thank you uh, sakthi i appreciate the opportunity um So category management is a strategic approach to looking at the purchase of goods and services, right? And it's a holistic approach. And more than that though, it's exciting because it's about understanding what's the future in this category. What's what don't we know now that we will learn about, right? That could transform how we consume this category. And what's going on in the business that will fundamentally change how we need or or don't need this category. So it's much more than a procurement strategy. You're actually developing a business strategy. Mm, I find that right. to be incredibly exciting and the participants who do this find it to be really valuable. It's an incredible career experience for people who are doing this. Yeah, in fact you had mentioned, you know, during one of the previous conversations that uh, uh category management allows the category manager to be the CEO of the category. That's exactly right because they have internal customers, they have external customers and stakeholders. They have to understand demand, they have to market. There's a huge amount of internal marketing going on, so you're actually you are the general manager of this space and the skills you develop in this role will stand you well for the rest of your career. Right? It's it's incredible. And based on your experience, Eric, you know, you've consulted with a lot of companies. So what percentage of companies actually do a category management any ballpark figure that you would like to share with us well, that's a great question a lot of people say they're doing category management and they're doing something slightly less um, okay maybe it's 50% of companies are doing something slightly less um, not that that's bad right because mm. you you can do category management to the extent that the company and your stakeholders are going to be okay with that level of thinking right and mm -hmm. uh, so you might have to push in a bit to do that but uh it's it's certainly less than half who think they are and they're doing some pretty advanced strategic sourcing which is i don't mean to cast aspersions it's not a bad thing to be doing right but it's not quite the same thing uh, in in fact i was coming to that uh, uh, you know there is a difference between category management and strategic sourcing am i right there absolutely is category management you're going to, there's typically within the scope when we agree what's in the category and what's not in the category within the scope of that category you can ask any question right and we'll we'll typically be into insourcing outsourcing questions pretty fundamental questions about the business should we be in this product or not and that is a fundamental business question right which will then be going to sponsors and senior leaders versus strategic sourcing is typically more narrow and is how do i sort this particular need again nothing wrong with that we have to we have to yep. do that to run the business but it's a different level of uh, investigation and thought absolutely absolutely in fact so we we touched upon briefly what is category management and the difference between category management and strategic sourcing now let's come to now the reality uh, next slide please you know supply chain is under chaos now you know so we can talk category management we can talk strategic sourcing you know there are a lot of frameworks and concepts out there but at the end of the day sourcing teams that is sourcing procurement teams 
will have to deal with the situation that they are currently facing with right irrespective of whatever frameworks that they are dealing with so uh, uh, eric you know before i move on to whale uh, uh, you know I've, I've made him wait for quite some time but eric <laughs> uh, uh, you know did, do you think the companies you know that have adopted category management uh, were in a position to better manage supply chain chaos i mean is it a self fulfilling statement uh, to make or is is there any difference between the two Typically, a company that has considered all of the business requirements, the fundamental business requirements in the category, will be in a better position when there's supply chain chaos because they will have considered upstream issues that could emerge in the supply chain, right? So they're tier two and beyond. And they're also more likely to have considered multi sourcing. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, an incredible number of items and services are sole or single sourced across your average company. I've seen it mm -hmm. as high as 95% in, in large world-class companies. And mm -hmm. so if there's a disruption and you're solar single sourced, you're going to feel that quite acutely versus if you're multi-sourced or have some other reasonable form of backup that you can get through this, right? And you see that right now with the, the extent of procurement firefighting is unbelievable, right? And people yeah. talk about um, the stress in the function. It's quite mm -hmm. acute right now. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So, Vail, um, you know, you are a market expert. So as the supply chain chaos, you know, is it kind of abated or is it sustaining? Uh, w what's happening? Can you give us a sense of, uh, you know, the market? Yeah, absolutely, Shakti, and uh, good day to everyone. So, Shakti, here are my observations. Uh, how many hours do you have for me to answer this question, Shakti? <laughs> mm. Two minutes. <laughs> two two to right. three minutes. All right, all right, all right. Two minutes then. So, Shakti, Oh, okay. Uh, so Shakti, with chaos being the new normal, I've got a mm. set of observations which I've seen successful sourcing organizations and procurement organizations take care of mm. the current state of supply chain chaos, and it's here to stay. Uh, one line answer to your question. But let me let me let me talk about what successful organizations have been doing in this particular space, uh, Shakti. One of the interesting things which um, which I heard about is that there was this poll which was run on who are the superheroes of the current supply chain chaos, uh, let's call it management mitigation strategies. And uh, number one on the poll was sourcing and procurement professionals, right? And I, th I thought that was a very, very interesting fact. And I think it also pays a lot of tribute to the work which is being done by the audience here and every other unsung procurement professional. So the points which I've seen, and I'll keep it really short from here, Shakti, is that number one, right? I've seen a lot of conversational AI being used in managing the current supply chain chaos. Any organization which has adopted this has come out uh, winning. That's number one. Number two is that I've seen a lot of trends on the reverse of globalization. So organizations who adapted their supply chain towards, I'm calling it deglobalization or reverse globalization of shorter value chains and supply chains, have done a fabulous job on actually managing the current state of supply chain chaos. A few other case studies which uh, I've observed myself uh, while working with uh, hundreds of our clients is uh, community baseline category management, right? So so you've got category management strategies which are baseline to your internal data and external data. Mm -hmm. But those who have actually taken that extra effort to baseline it to what others are doing, uh, the comparison would be market share for sales professionals. What are you doing in terms of baselining your category management strategy to your competitors? Uh, do you have a spend baseline benchmark compared to your competitors? And how have you managed uh, the amount of inventory which you hold, uh, how many days of production losses have your suppliers faced, being able to benchmark those parameters. I've seen those come out as clear winners. In simple terms, anybody who's got a digital twin of their mm -hmm. supply chain in the current chaotic environment, where they're able to simulate probabilistic approaches, have been able to actually take care of uh, the best they can as to where the market is. Okay, that's a very interesting observation, Vail. Uh, you know, uh, the use of technology. You're seeing that uh, it's slowly deepening in the market. So, Eric, you know, before we move on, you know, I have this one question, you, because you mentioned single source and multi-source. Mm -hmm. So, this this argument about you know not having to depend on a single source. Well, there are industries, you know, where companies will have to rely uh, on a single source supplier. I know, I know, we have discussed this before, but the yes. benefit of uh, uh, in our audience, for example certain specialty chemicals uh, you know for example come only from china you know at the height of the trump trade war someone challenged us to find an alternate source of supply uh, for the material that they source from china 
so so the question here is you know what about the truly immobile items that do not have alternate sources of supply you know from your experience uh, you know how 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 good is that you know what percentage is that and is it is it a large percentage or a small percentage any uh, insight that you can provide there are some categories that are undeniably more difficult than others where their supply sources are very constrained you mentioned uh, chemicals um, people who are running sterilization as a category have been facing mm -hmm. years of trouble right and so mm -hmm. it, that is a known fact so people who are doing that start looking at what are some of the other parameters right how much do i truly need to be sterilizing at what level am i sterilizing it versus what i've done historically not to it not to break rules but to make sure that we're following the actual rule and not some perceived limitation same thing will happen with chemicals and i have seen uh, large companies actually develop new suppliers to get around those constraints that's not mm -hmm. a short-term solution right the company i know who did that it took 10 years to move in essence, $100 million worth of spend from a problematic supplier to a new good supplier. That's not mm. overnight. And that took management commitment to do that. It's possible. Mm. And there are other categories where you are likely to stay single sourced because of the way it works, right? So the auditor for a, uh, a, a corporation, you're not going to have multiple auditors. You're going to have a firm who's signing off on your audit, as an example, right? Okay. There are others as well. But uh, that's where we're going to go into the fundamental business requirements of the category and truly understand what's required versus mm -hmm. what's optional and have that conversation with stakeholders absolutely absolutely in fact uh, this business impact we will come to that uh, soon uh, you know uh, i know you have a very interesting anecdote to share uh, moving on uh, next slide please uh, I know, uh, Vail, uh, you touched upon uh, some of the aspects uh, you know a few minutes ago so you know, what are some of the measures uh, taken by companies currently to assure supply security? Because whoever I speak to, you know, supply assurance and supply security is uh, one of the key priorities right now, uh, because there are so many things that are happening around the world. The pandemic happened, sudden closure, opening up, and there is an unfortunate war going on, which is again, uh, in fact, I was just looking at the latest report, Whale, you know, uh, because of the war in Europe, the you know, there, there was we, we, the expectation was the fertilizer would become prices would become dearer, right? But then I saw something counterintuitive from our research team saying because of the natural gas price weakening, uh, you know, the fertilizer prices may actually uh, soften up in the short term. So because there's so much uncertainty, that's what. So when we expect the prices are you know going up, you know, it's it's going down. When we think okay, it's a beautiful day, and suddenly there is a war breaks out. So <clears throat> what are some of the measures, Vail, from your experience that you have seen in the market that the companies have taken to assure supply security? Sure, absolutely, Shakti. So quite a few things which I've observed firsthand. Uh, so the first thing which I've noticed is the ability to build a shock-proof uh, supply chain, right? And mm -hmm. the way in which I, I'm, I'm seeing a, a, a very, very, very clear trend, at least over the last four months, uh, Shakti, is that I've noticed that there is a huge spike in terms of, um, let's call it recruitment of regional category managers, right? And it's a very, very interesting mm -hmm. concept where um, large organizations tend to have uh, a, a, a huge number of global category managers. And you probably have a few regional hubs uh, for buying for locally sourced materials, which really doesn't fit into your global strategy. So one of the things which I've noticed is that a lot of global category management strategies are now being, I don't know whether downshifted is the right term because it sounds like a, uh, like, um, like a reverse of an upgrade, but then there's a lot of shorter supply chains which are being created where mm -hmm. I'm basically sourcing from what you call as uh, nations which are near shore, right? So number yeah. one, I've seen a lot of reshoring happening. I'm seeing a lot of supply being sourced even at a premium from locations which are not necessarily from the far east right so that's that's mm -hmm. one point which i've seen as a trend the second trend around yeah yeah absolutely absolutely the second uh, point shakti is on the shock proof supply chain right and what i mean mm -hmm. by that is how do you predict risk rather than just preventing risk or not taking mm -hmm. any action at all and mm -hmm. um, there are there are multiple ways in which you can actually set for example uh, social media alerts on a labor unrest problem which might actually create a supply problem in a particular region. 
Uh, mm -hmm. How do I understand that a factory is going to idle capacity? And then how do I make sure that I buy on time? How do I understand whether I buy long or short? How do I know whether I need to buy spot or contract? So the ability to have a robust framework in which there's a lot of data which actually flows in, which helps me quickly adapt my category management strategy in uh, in lieu of a huge supply chain issue or a supply shortage issue is one of the ways in which I've seen a lot of category managers, both global and regional, handle any kind of supply uh, chain or supply spikes or uh, let's let's say in this current market supply fall uh, to be able to take care of this issue, Shakti. Okay, that's great. Uh, moving on, uh, next slide, please. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, before we talk, uh, I, 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 okay, we will come to this, uh, Eric. Uh, you know, I, I just got a question here uh, from George Cleveland. I know we haven't formally opened up the audience Q&A, but then I thought this question is pertinent to answer right now. So George is asking, is this webinar only going to be focused on commodities uh, category management? Uh, you know, my team is uh, more services focused, you know, particularly labor. So Eric. Uh, category management for services i know i know you this keeps coming to you so what would you tell uh, george so what i would tell george is category management works in services just as well as it works in commodities um, mm -hmm. so uh, we've used it across the direct the indirect the r d space the capital space um, it will work in any category every category is a little bit different um, there will be nuances with each one, uh, but the process is absolutely applicable across the whole range of spend. Uh, mm -hmm. I have not found, trust me, over 25 years I've been thrown into a number of different categories where people say, see what you can do in that one. And mm -hmm. I have yet to find a category where it doesn't work, but that doesn't mean it's easy, right? Um, but it does work in indirect space. I think the first principles are the same, right? I mean, whether it's uh, directs or indirects, the first principles of category management would be the same just that how the how it is executed would differ absolutely and some of the differences between direct and indirect not to go down into too much detail comes into measurement right because it gets to be a little absolutely. bit more nuanced in the indirect space um, and some of the governance sometimes is easier sometimes it's more difficult everything gets a little bit different in the indirect space but it's absolutely applicable okay thanks thanks for that uh, answer eric okay so now we now we're moving on to digitalization you know, that's the buzzword uh, you know, uh, category management is, is somehow, I mean, don't get me wrong, Eric, it feels, when, when I hear category management, it feels old school, you know, because there are so many shiny new digital solutions uh, that are out there in the market, which the procurement teams would love to, you know, deploy and then show ROI right up front, right, because it's, it's the trend, it's the jade gist, so to speak. So, uh, this is important because uh, if, when procurement is facing competing priorities because there's only so much budget that they have uh, for new initiatives and they have they, they also carry the additional burden of uh, showcasing roi you know for any investment that they make right uh, especially to the business so when that is the situation you know how can they think of category management in this age of digitalization that's a great question um and I do know, you know, working with procurement leadership teams, they are absolutely under pressure to demonstrate return on investment, right? What's their efficiency and effectiveness as a function? Mm. And the analogy I like to use here is most of us drive, right? We drive cars, we drive trucks, and those, those are pretty basic skills. Yet you look at some of the cars and trucks we're driving today, which have lots of digital tools. Right? Lots of new features. Category management is kind of the same thing. You can do it manually, right? And you can do all of that different work, the analysis, the uh, market intelligence gathering. You can do that all manually, but why wouldn't you use the digital tools? I'm a mm. strong proponent of the digital tools where they help you drive efficiency and effectiveness um, when you can access this information real time and it's global. Right? It's not just what I've always known. Digital really helps people understand what's possible. And category mm -hmm. management is all about understanding the world of possibility. Of course, of course. Uh, uh, okay, uh, moving on, uh, next question, uh, next slide, please. Yes, so we spoke about 
the competing priorities and there's so many shiny new solutions out there in the market and to 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 such an extent that you know some procurement leaders actually told me that it's distracting <laughs> now is category management exclusively possible via a digital tool eric or um, do you i mean can it can it also be done old school you know without a digital tool uh, what's your take on it because of course you've been doing this for 30 years obviously right. there was no digital tool back then uh, but yeah, thanks for so reminding many new me solutions. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the, the world is yeah. changing so i'm I, and i'm just curious to know how uh, you know it's it's tied in to the latest trends uh, that are happening in the market you know i don't think it's possible to do it right now exclusively with a digital tool and that's because category management to be successful one of the number one precepts of category management is active stakeholder engagement mm. and if we're going to say and who knows what's possible, right? Because 10 yeah. years ago, I'd say you can't have a self-driving car to finish the analogy, but you can under mm -hmm. certain circumstances, right? So I don't know what's possible in the future, but right now stakeholders expect to be engaged. And most importantly for us, we need to listen to them, right? And mm -hmm. so to the extent a future digital tool could do that, maybe, but for now, they are an adjunct to thinking capable procurement people. That's the way I would view it. Now, if you come down from category management, there are certainly discrete sourcing events, which you can do with a lot of digital help and they can mm -hmm. help move things forward, right? But to get up into the world where we're engaging stakeholders, talking to them about business requirements and understanding their hopes and fears for their piece of the business, which is a part of what we're doing in the category, category management process, uh, we're not doing that with the digital tool right now. We'll document yeah. everything digitally, but we're not going to use the tool to go out and do that conversation. So it's a it's a very people intensive process, right? Because there's a lot of coordination that's required, and you need to get a business win. Uh, so you're saying that there's a lot of human to human interaction, communication, world world talking, radio style that's required to for a successful deployment of category management strategies. Yeah. Exactly right. Um, we're not taking orders from stakeholders and going out and buying stuff. We're mm. actually going to them up front and saying, tell me what you need and why. And let's understand your business. What's working? Mm. What's not working? Mm -hmm. And from that, we'll go out and craft a solution, right? Because our job is to be the marketplace expert. And that, um, that thought process, uh, that engagement process with stakeholders, I don't see that we can automate that in the near term. Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, Will, any thoughts on this before we move on? Is it exclusively possible via digital tool, category management? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So let me answer that question, Shakti, and I'm also going to backtrack a little bit if you're all right with it. So on that question from George, and I think it was a fabulous mm -hmm. question. Um, mm -hmm. So I used to be the head of Indrex uh, at Vero before I moved to Live.ai, which which mm -hmm. is the digital tool. Um, so Shakti, on Indrex, uh, um, on, on, on that interesting question, which uh, basically came in, one of the things which I've noticed when it comes to category management for Indrex is how do the AQS CRSR parameters rearrange themselves when you're sourcing the RECs or Indrex? So what I'm thinking right now on George's question is um, supply is tangible when you look at it from a direct perspective and hence assurance of supply becomes an issue because there is a finite supply of a commodity of a product so on and so forth but indrex is very interesting because it's theoretically infinite right so if i need a service i can get it because service does not deplete it's a service which is being provided for example to a sourcing organization or to the business within an organization. So what happens is there is a stronger focus from a, from a category management perspective on quality and innovation. So like, like Eric said, having the right SLAs, KPIs, measurement mechanisms with suppliers when it comes to indirects will define how effective your indirect uh, sourcing strategy is. Combined with, for example, a strong alerting mechanism, which basically tells you that, hey, this particular job role in this particular region might go in short supply talk to your supplier, right? This supplier just got awarded a huge contract. They just became 5X revenue in one month. You might be deprioritized as a customer. What do you need to do? How do I be the favorite customer? So I think it's 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 very fluidic. I think it's very abstract and that makes indirect category management very interesting. So I just wanted to throw in those points. And uh, on, on this question on digital tools, uh, being able to support category management, my paycheck is signed by live.ai so the answer is yes i think it's absolutely <laughs> uh, i think i think it's absolutely possible by our digital tools Shakti. i think i think okay. i think sometimes sometimes we uh, overestimate 
uh, digital tools. End of the day, they are nothing but packets of information put into a framework, which helps me with decision making. I think the tacit knowledge of being uh, making the right recommendations completely definitely lies with the category managers and humans. And I think uh, the openness to actually use digital tools to support decision making is where the differentiator is. And companies which adopt them, which integrate them into the internal systems, have been able to go to speed to market when it comes to sourcing and category management faster than others who haven't. So it's all about uh, speed to market and being able to get information on the fly, and sometimes even before an event occurs. So that's the way I would look at digital tools. Okay, interesting. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the role of procurement intel. So if category management is the macrocosm. Procurement Intel is the microcosm and um, uh, category management, you know, when someone sets up a program, uh, it's not possible to run the program without uh, procurement intelligence, that is without market intelligence, right? Uh, so, I mean, as I said, uh, uh, you know, during my introduction, category management is a strategic activity. Uh, individual category manager cannot initiate it. It has to obviously come from the CPO level uh, and then th there has to be an executive buy-in uh for a successful implementation of the program uh, whereas uh, 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 procurement intelligence uh, can also be a strategic as well as uh, at the tactical level so for example a procurement manager is uh, you know stuck uh, in, in a supply negotiation and they want to somehow verify the pricing uh, or maybe the rate card uh, their, their procurement intel can be used as a, in a tactical manner to get necessary information and then go and uh, uh, you know conclude the negotiation but at the same time uh, we always we always recommend procurement intelligence uh, to be deployed as a uh, as part of a larger category strategy uh, so uh, well you know you are the expert in procurement intelligence so and of course you have also given inputs to eric uh, you know while he was writing this book on uh, uh, category management so what role can procurement intel play in category management sure absolutely shakti uh, a a one-line answer to that, Shakti, would be that is that procurement intelligence is basically nothing but uh, your eyes and ears on the street, right? So that's mm -hmm. that's that's the way I would actually define procurement intelligence. How do you how do you understand what the murmurs in the market are? How do I understand what the price is going to be 12 months from today? How do I know whether my tier two supplier is actually going to face a supply constraint for one of their raw materials? How do mm -hmm. I know whether there is going to be a supply chain breakdown at a particular port a week before it basically happens? It could be congestion, it could be a traffic null, a port wise, airport wise, so on and so forth. So I think that's where procurement intelligence plays a, a very, very integral role in actually supporting category management. Okay, uh, Eric, uh, of course, you wrote a chapter on the importance of market intelligence slash procurement intelligence in running a successful category management program and you've been there and done that uh, what's your opinion on this so category management is based on intellectual curiosity what's impossible now but if we could do it could transform this category and if you don't have ready access to what's possible out there with wonderful market intelligence it's hard to answer that question and most people know what they know Right, and what they don't know is where breakthrough tends to come from. So having ready access to market intelligence, uh, number one, makes the role of a category manager a lot easier. I'm not gonna say it makes it easy, but it makes it easier. And it does provide windows into areas they may not have otherwise seen. It's invaluable. Mm. Okay, so uh, we are getting a lot of comments on, you know, uh, how to understand better uh, you know, the procurement Intel framework, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we would like to run a poll now, which was quickly put together by my team in the backend team. Uh, team, can we please run the poll to get the audience pulse currently? Okay, can we have the poll please? Yes. Uh, uh, would you like to explore how Burroughs procurement Intel offerings can help drive a business advantage? You can either say yes or a no. Uh, you can, I mean, you, you don't have to answer it if you don't want to, but it's a quick poll that we are running. Uh, please feel free to answer it at the same time if uh, someone who's if, if say someone at the senior level currently uh, attending this webinar say director and above cpo uh, level uh, folks if you would like to even uh, you know go further and figure out how better to integrate category management along with procurement intel offerings uh, 
we are happy to answer that also you can drop us a message uh, we are happy to uh, you know give you uh, the solution for that so while people are answering that poll uh, eric there's this very interesting question from carmel uh, fegelman uh, what key information that are being captured in tools because we spoke about tools right and what are the some of the key features of tools uh, for uh, best in class uh, category management okay great question thank you for that so uh, we back up right so we're capturing yeah, information yeah. Go on. Uh, yeah. From, yeah we're capturing the information because we need to have the the knowledge management for the organization right and so i don't want people to think about category management as filling in templates right there are typically documentation elements in any process and that's so that the next person who goes into that role can figure out what you were thinking and why right and so the documentation is important what we will typically capture um, who are the stakeholders and why are we talking to them what did they say to us about what's important in this category what are their business requirements? And I think it was Vale who mentioned AQS CIR, right? So that's the uh, the construct we use for business requirements. What are their go, no go, and scalable business requirements? And then what's going on in the market, right? So the supply market. What? Who are the good suppliers now? Where are they? What's their strategy? Who are the mm -hmm. up and coming suppliers? Who's leaving and why? Mm -hmm. uh, from that, we'll then do a, a range of strategic analysis to develop insights. Category management is insight based because what we're going to then do with those insights is go to the stakeholders and share those th those uh, pearls to mm. build their readiness for change. Right. And so absolutely. Um, as an example, you know, we worked on a, a large fleet uh, sales car fleet, domestic fleet in the United States. And mm -hmm. one of the findings in the at, and it was factually correct at the time was that two of the three big uh, three US automakers would never go bankrupt. Um, one of the large Japanese auto manufacturers wasn't big enough to do this fleet. And those were some of their conclusions that drove what they decided. Once the recession hit, of course, two of the three US auto manufacturers did go bankrupt and the Japanese auto manufacturer was the largest in the world. And so we could look at what they decided in the past and then modify that strategy very quickly to reflect what was the new reality in the supply market. So documenting the information helps you go faster subsequently. All right, we capture our okay. thoughts as we're going through so we can talk to stakeholders, we can talk to executives and get approval. Later on, we can refresh or redo a strategy very quickly based on that documentation. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Uh, apologies. I think that the poll got stuck on the screen and my team in the back end was, was trying to take it off screen. Uh, apologies. Yeah. You know, we were off uh, the radar for some time. Uh, thank you for all those uh, people who voted in the poll, but we have not done with the discussion yet. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is my favorite part, uh, Eric. You know, uh, we, we had several discussions on category management. Uh, so you told me that category management is not just about managing a category, but it can also have a larger business impact. Uh, and I distinctly remember you telling me the example of a company that was uh, into the business of payments. Am I right? Uh, Correct. So why don't you regale the audience with that tale? Right. So I was working with a colleague and it was a, uh, a Midwestern United States paving company. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, what often happens with category management with uh, executives who are a little curious is they, they see the tools and they say, I want to see a little more, bring them in. Mm -hmm. And so we were sitting with the CEO uh, and their leadership team, and we went through a couple of the core tools. And the epiphany that the, the CEO had was that what he was selling, asphalt, right, uh, pavement, was actually a pretty generic product. And therefore, he was going to spend the rest of his life competing on price predominantly, right, in a tough marketplace. And so it forced him and his team to step back and say, if that's the world, what could I do to differentiate what I'm selling? And he then became quite adept at paving ra uh, racing courses, right? Uh, race so tracks. it was racetracks, right? And so mm. still pavement, but it's not the same pavement and it's a very small industry with a higher profit margin. And that was a fundamental business change that he was able to see as a result of using some of the procurement tools. Imagine, 
from uh, being in the business of paving the payments and you know, on the curb side to paving racetracks, uh, you know, like IndyMac, NASCAR type racetracks. I mean, that's it's phenomenal. And, and you cool. you'd also give uh, you know there was another example that you quoted and uh, someone had an epiphany and they actually switched jobs right uh, there was I think the person was part of your workshop and then decided to uh, move to a startup or something uh, if I'm not mistaken we were working with a a director from a large medical environment and uh, actually went to become the head of procurement in the cannabis industry. Um, <laughs> which um, was, you know, rapid growth, um, mm -hmm. still regulated, right? And so all the learnings that come from a highly regulated environment apply, uh, mm. but move to a much faster, more agile environment because it was uh, growing so quickly. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, it's, I mean, that's the beauty, right? I mean, the uh, category management helps you in uh, thinking differently. So from thinking category, if you think business, uh, procurement, in fact, it was procurement's initiative that, uh, uh, enable the company uh, moving from paving you know, normal payments uh, on the street side to paving racetracks. So that exactly. was the kind of impact that the team uh, brought into the company and you were direct witness to it. Absolutely. Um, just a, another great. quick a quick short yeah, story yeah. Uh, oh. from the aerospace industry a couple of years before COVID. Um, mm -hmm. Aerospace, there were seven years or more of firm fixed orders, right? And everyone wanted to move to composite uh, manufacturing because all the new yeah. airplanes are composites and cars have lots of composites and so all the capacity between automotive and aerospace was taken up in the composite in industry where mm -hmm. wasn't it taken up was in boating and mm -hmm. so we uh, we found a manufacturer who made sailboat masts and had built mm -hmm. a 150 long 150 foot long autoclave for parts that was basically sitting empty and in mm -hmm. exchange for getting into the aerospace industry, they did all the one-time uh, regulatory and manufacturing engineering qualification because they wanted to play in that space. That's the power of market intelligence, knowing what's out there that still has capacity in mm -hmm. your space and who's going to be interested. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I think we have uh, the questions are flowing thick and flow, so let's formally open up the audience Q&A. Uh, yeah, that's good. Uh, so this is from... Christoph Ferrar, uh, I hope I pronounced the surname correctly. Uh, apologies if I didn't. Uh, the question is not if, question is how do you keep the categories and classifications accurate and complete with new technologies? I think that's a very uh, important question, right? Because uh, we, we talk about category management, but then oftentimes uh, teams get bogged down with nomenclatures. Uh, you know, it's not an exciting way. topic, but taxonomy right taxonomy, how we yes, def yeah. yes how we define the categories uh, level one two three and so on many companies use the uh, the unspsc coding other companies use their own coding um, what i would suggest is agree the coding use whatever it is and then the most important thing about category management is when you're getting started get the scope right on that category um, many companies oh. will start with a, an overly broad scope which both slows things down and um, makes it quite cumbersome versus if you have a yeah. relatively narrow scope, you can go quickly, you can demonstrate results and you can build a sense of enthusiasm and passion for the process. So who owns it, the taxonomy? Uh, is it typically the top management or is it left to the category managers? Because if, especially yeah. there are times, you know, a category is divided between two managers and then they come up with their own taxonomy, creating confusions. Uh, the, the taxonomy should be set by uh, the leadership of the function uh, in okay. concert with whoever is running that um, that element of the uh, the financial organization. And there should be one source of truth. To have multiple category managers redefining things is not going to end well, right? So we want to have a standard <laughs> definition set. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, this next question is pointedly to Vail, a question to Vail. Uh, you spoke about conversational AI in procurement. Uh, can you please throw some use cases of conversational AI in procurement slash category management? This is from uh, Abbas Ali Jawarwala. Oh, absolutely. Uh, thanks, thanks, Abbas, for that question. Shakti, before I answer Abbas's question, can I just add on a few points to what Eric uh, mentioned? Or oh, yeah, yeah, please. Please go on. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay. All right, all right. So, so interesting question which had come in on the classification piece, uh, Shakti. And then uh, I've had uh, a couple of 
really large clients uh, in Europe in the manufacturing and material space who kind of got in touch with us on, on, on the same question. So one of the things uh, which we developed as an output, a usable piece of, uh, let's call it decision making, is uh, is a is a is a output which will actually help you toggle across different uh, nomenclatures and classifications. Like Eric said, you've got the NAICS, you've got the UNSPSC, and of course you've got the E class in Europe. You've got SIC, you've got GICS. This is a whole bunch, and then the ones which are custom, so on and so forth. So so the ability to be able to understand what a category means across two, four, six, eight-digit systems. And to be able to understand what does this in UNSPC transpose in NAACS, being able to have that in handy across every procurement organization, I've seen real time solves a lot of problems in terms of defining the eye levels of categories, especially when you're building a guided category strategy. So just, just thought I'll throw it out there that there are uh, outputs which actually help you reconcile eye levels of different categories. And mm -hmm. if that's something which Vero can help with, we'd be happy to do that. So I just wanted to throw it out there. On on, sure. on on Abbas's question on, on conversational AI. So Abbas, what I meant by conversational AI is, um, so let's assume you're looking at uh, a standard uh, chatbot, right? A chatbot would actually talk to a CRM or a sales output to be able to tell you that here's what sales has been in this particular region. Uh, here's what sales has looked like in the last six months, so on and so forth. And that's exactly what I'm not talking about, right? So what I'm talking about in terms of conversation AI is the ability for you to query a, a system which basically says, hey, what volume should I buy if prices go up by 10% in this particular commodity? How do I negotiate with a supplier in the indirect category, for example, if borders close in terms of sourcing a particular service, right? So that, that is the complexity of conversational AI. And one of the one of the things which I've seen in terms of successful AI deployment in terms of conversational techniques is the ability to take abstract data fuzzy logic and be able to make sense of what's changing across different attributes in a particular category and come up with a recommendation engine which basically tells you here are the options. What is your uh, end goal? What is your use case? Uh, if your use case is to uh, save costs. Here's what you can actually do. Here's here's a here's a strategy developed purely by AI. If your goal is go to speed to market, I'm in the pharma industry. I'm I'm really not worried about budgets. Here's the strategy. Here are the suppliers you need to be working with. So the way I looked at conversational AI is that it's got different routes. The routes are defined by your use case. What are your priorities? And it clearly tells you that if this is what you want. Here's something which you might want to consider. And I, I, I've seen successful deployments of these. And of course, this is something which keeps getting better and better from a data science perspective. Absolutely. Uh, we are getting some really great questions. And I, I know I'm finding it very difficult to pick and choose which one to uh, you know, showcase here. So this one is from Karen Henry. Uh, what are some of the best practices for consistently pushing out MI to category managers versus waiting for them to formally request MI? for their one time a year category strategy presentation? It's a classic operational question that Karen has asked you. Can I give a one line answer on that, uh, Shakti? I think Eric's yeah, preparing himself possible. for the answer, I think so. <laughs> uh, so Shakti, I, I, I think it's proactive pushes, right? So mm -hmm. I think being able to consume market intelligence, which proactively is pushed out, right? And it could be from uh, analysts within an organization. It could be from the COE team. It could be from a big shiny tool, right? Whatever. But category managers getting this push alert, which shocks them, gets them to jump out of the seats saying, this is what's going to change. And if you do not change a category management strategy, this is going to be the impact on your on your product or, or your commodity. That I've seen is the biggest driver of consuming market intelligence. Okay. Okay, I think uh, we'll move on because we're getting a lot of questions. I think this one uh, for Eric, uh, with all the experience in category management, what tips or techniques are recommended to influence or steer the main stakeholders from a category management management perspective? Uh, how frequently should the category management strategy should be checked and aligned with the uh, short, mid and long term version? So this question is from Nelson Delgado Montes. Eric. Okay. Okay. Just making a note here. Sure, sure. So, how do we engage? 
Right, and so the best practice that we see in engagement now is one where it's a dialogue, a discussion, right? And um, there's a phrase in the uh, in the coaching industry that's called appreciative inquiry, where we're going to open up a conversation with somebody and we're going to listen to them and build that dialogue. Early on, we used to use some of the uh, Six Sigma approaches, in particular, the five whys. Mm -hmm. And really, the only person who should get away with asking five whys is a toddler, right? Because otherwise, mm -hmm. adults find it to be pretty annoying. Um, and so we don't want to use that so much with stakeholders unless we know for a fact it's going to work. But we want to have that dialogue and meet them where they are, right? So we want to understand what their preference is. If they want to meet face-to-face, -face, go meet with them face-to-face -face if you can, right? Virtually or in person. If they're more distant and they want to do uh, email, then you can start the conversation that way. Uh, we've seen both uh, different cultures work that way, but start having the conversation and understanding what, what's important to them. As far as the frequency of the updates, um, you're going to get the classic consulting answer, right? So the first thing is it depends, right? Depends on what's going on in the world. And if the world shifts, uh, whether it's conflict, whether it's some other uh, economic upheaval, that strategy needs to be revisited. Um, and if the world isn't shifting, depending on the nature of the category, we will identify uh, what are the key markers that if they do arise in the economy or in the labor force, we want to relook at this uh, strategy. That's one of the key elements that we'll put in. Uh, at a minimum, it's typically two to three years. Sometimes it's more often than that. Uh, longer term strategies where we're starting to do big stranded capital investments might be uh, oh. less frequent than that. Okay. Uh, next question is from Henry Chacon. In the next six months, what do you see as the biggest challenge for category managers taking into account the first half of 2022? I think this is right up your alley, Vail. Would you like to answer this? Can you repeat the question for me, um, Shakti? In, in the next six months, what do you see as the biggest challenge for category managers uh, taking into account the first half of 2022? Basically, uh, uh, Henry is saying so much has happened in this first six months. So if you take these challenges into account, what do you see as the biggest challenge for category managers in the second half? Yeah, so let me give a commodity product or uh, direct category answer and then an indirect answer. Number one problem which I've noticed people say for the exact same question which came in uh, Shakti is um, how much inventory do I hold? Uh, how mm -hmm. do I take care of carrying costs? Number one problem because um, port conditions, um, yes. laborers basically um, not being able to work because products didn't come in either at the supplier side or even at your site, right? So inventory carrying costs, biggest problem for the next six months. How do you determine that? How do you budget that, right? So that's number one for direct commodities. For indirects, I think it's 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 a little bit more complex. And In index is how do how do I basically contribute towards my SGNA optimization? And what I mean by that is every organization's got a standard SGA, SGNA as a percentage of revenue baseline. How do I how do I make sure that that is absolutely optimized? Which also means how do I make my indirect categories, especially marketing, consulting, so on and so forth, which can actually have an impact on business operations strategy, not just in cost savings but also in revenue enhancement. I think that's the biggest uh, uh, problem or uh, that's the biggest uh, use case which will have to be solved from an index perspective. Okay, so next yes. question, I think. Uh, uh, Sakti, I just wanna to add to that. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. What I'm seeing is um, there's a big prioritization to deal with inflation and supply chain issues. And mm -hmm. there's, uh, as a result, people are fighting fires more than they're thinking about the future, right? Mm -hmm. if, if I'm worried about the house burning down today, I'm not worried about tomorrow. And mm -hmm. I think that's going to come back to haunt people, right? I'm not saying ignore inflation and supply chain issues, but in most procurement organizations, it shouldn't take everybody to do that. And you should still have some people who are able to work on strategies. Absolutely. Okay. So next question is from Nicholas Burt. How would you recommend to overcome stakeholders that don't see the value in the category management process and see it only as a procurement tool? I know we had discussed this uh, before, uh, Eric. Uh, so what would you tell Nicholas? That is a hard question, right? Um, number one. Um, and typically, 
stakeholders want to see where it's actually worked. And so having a paper that you can demonstrate, this is how it's worked in this industry. So it's real, it's not just a hypothetical thing that you're coming and saying, intellectually, we should try this because it makes sense, but you can actually demonstrably show this is where it's worked and this is the value they've achieved. That helps credibility. We've taken people to see it in practice. Um, and then there's the practical reality that not every stakeholder will get it, right? Um, no. That's just how the world works. Um, what we're doing with category management is we're taking the patient to the doctor and the doctor saying, you're out of shape, right? And that's a tough message. It's much better if the patient says, I'd like to change, right? Mm -hmm. And so helping the, uh, the stakeholder or the patient in this case come to the realization that there is a new way of working that's possible and it's not too scary for me. I can do it, right? And it will yield me personal benefits. That's the journey we have to take people on. But uh, but even the, for example, if a stakeholder doesn't want, if absolutely saying, you know, I think we should just move on, right? I mean, it is possible to deploy category management for uh, either a one or a set of categories. They don't have to do it for all the categories, right? Exactly. I mean, yeah. So if someone is no. not in favor of it, I think there's no point in fighting that battle. Uh, I mean, like you said, try to convince them as much as possible. But if they are not, uh, you know in agreement even after that just move on and deploy the category strategy or, or rather category management for other categories we worked with one company and the uh, the general counsel said absolutely not you will not do category manager management in the legal services and it wasn't actually until he left his role that we were able to get in the door in another company it was the first spend area mm -hmm. and the general counsel said i've seen this work other places i need your help right and so absolutely. It, it's very variable that way yeah, it is very, very absolutely. Uh, okay, so next question again, very interesting from David uh, Princiotto. Uh, do you think that machine learning can help us to improve category strategy uh, in the next few years? And what could be the impact on the cost optimization side? Uh, who do you like to take? I mean, Vail, would you like to take this? Let me let me quickly ask Eric. Eric, do you want to take that? I need you to clarify the question for me, Sakthi. You said mission okay. learning. Machine, machine learning, machine, machine learning. learning, machine learning. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now with that context, repeat the question for me and then I'll, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah. Do you think that machine learning can help us to improve category strategy in the next few years? And what could be the impact on the cost optimization side? Well, absolutely. That can help. Um, the trick is going to be with machine learning to, to find the spaces where we'll get the biggest impact right away versus trying to put it too broadly in spaces where it may not be a ready fit. Um, it relates to the prior conversation, right? We wanna go where we're gonna be um, successful. And so find the spot where machine learning is most ready to play and that will absolutely help out. Okay, uh, Will, any thoughts? Really quick, Shakti. Um, machine learning and NLP. I think when it comes to cost optimization, fairly straightforward. Price forecasting is going to be the biggest driver of cost optimization, being able to understand what's going to change in terms of price volatility. And machine learning plays a huge role in being able to understand what are the different factors which can affect costs. Your entire stochastic models are built on machine learning. And if you have the right factors in place, and if you have the ability to actually put in unforeseen conditions which might come in and throw the market away if you have that model in place i think you're going to be able to optimize costs uh, tremendously that would be my take on this okay so next question i, I know we have two two minutes three two three minutes left on the clock so maybe we could take a couple of questions uh, eric and Vail before we close out so this one is from amy hill a very interesting question again uh, my company has gone through a recent merger and the company we acquired uh, is the Wild West, you know, quote unquote, the <laughs> Wild West. Uh, folks could do whatever they wanted. Uh, so that's the uh, metaphor she's using. Folks could do whatever they wanted. What's the best way to deliver category management approach so that it's accepted? Well, that will be an interesting culture change, right? Mm. Um, 
the company culture actually plays out in category management, right? Because uh, the power that stakeholders have in decision making is all the way through the procurement process. And so in the Wild West, I would bring the categories under control first, which are most business critical, because you're going to have the most executive support. The categories that are least business critical, most okay with stakeholder discretion, don't go there first, right? Because that will be viewed as a pure power play versus um, when you have a merger, you're driving for synergy integration, you're driving for cat, uh, contract optimization, and you're going to do you're going to have to pay for the merger as well, right? So you're going to do that in the core categories first and then spread out from there. But you want to build some absolute internal success stories first. Okay. Uh, any thoughts, Will, or should I move on to the next question? I think we can move on. I think Eric covered okay. it well. Yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, this is from Mohammad Rida. How we how can we diversify the suppliers but still get a good volume discount? I think it's a very <laughs> straight question. You know, diversify suppliers but still get a volume discount. All right. I'm going to jump on that one, Sakthi, right? So the goal of category management is the fewest suppliers that fully meet the business requirements, mm. right? And we're doing that so that we can optimize our marketplace leverage. Now, you notice I didn't say single source, right? Yeah. And I'm a strong proponent of multi-sourcing. And mm. it's not the solution for everything, right? But it is a good approach to consider. So diversifying suppliers is really prevalent all over the place, right? People, for good reason, are... Uh, Bail was talking about some nearshoring, right? We're changing how we're looking, whether it's regional strategies. There's a lot of pressure to look at small and diverse suppliers, which is a wonderful thing. So we might actually add some suppliers, but that addresses business requirements around redundancy. It addresses uh, business requirements around uh, putting the spend with diverse suppliers. And what I think you're gonna find is that instead of losing your discount, if you're sole sourced or single sourced and the supplier knows that you're over a barrel, so you may think you're getting the right discount. In my experience, a lot of times by having some competition in your supply market, you actually do better. Hmm. It's not a panacea, okay. right? I'm not gonna promise a panacea, but I, I would not worry so much about it. I would still follow the process. Okay, so one last question, gentlemen. Uh, this, from, this is from Ramdan, uh, Ramdan Azedin Hadbi. Uh, what advice would you have to uh, drive a category strategy globally? Uh, well, that is, what advice would you give uh, to drive a category strategy globally, considering, number one, global corporate organization, uh, number two, low interest in the category from high-level stakeholder, and number three, key st impacted stakeholders or operational employees? So he's giving three scenarios. What advice would you give? Uh, to drive a category strategy globally, considering it's a global corporate organization, but there is low interest uh, in the category from high level stakeholders and the key impacted employees are all operational employees. So would you recommend in that situation to go for category management? Well, the number one thing that you're gonna have to make sure is in place, Ramdan will have to step back and look at is do I have governance, right? Do I have sponsorship at the senior level? Mm -hmm. And if I have sponsorship, the, the watch out here was there's low uh, interest at the senior level. If there's low interest at the senior level, why are we doing category management globally, right? That's the first question. Yeah. Um, we need to have senior alignment. And if we have senior alignment, let's proceed. And if we don't, then let's step back. Um, the other thing I would say is a global strategy does not necessarily mean a global supplier or one global solution. My global strategy could be to have regional solutions. That's my global mm. approach, right? And more and more I see that playing out. So I'd be careful about that. And then the other issue with global strategies is business requirements are often different in different regions of the world. And don't fall into the trap of saying, well, wherever the headquarters is, they'll end up dictating the business requirements <laughs> because that doesn't work well when you get out into the different parts of the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we have run out of time. Avail, any final comments that you have before we close out? Um, so I think uh, one liner would be digital twins of your supply chain, Shakti, if organizations can actually test and focus on that. 
I think a, a, a lot of these category management based problems uh, can be solved. That's the way I would I would end uh, uh, my inputs on this. Okay, Eric, any final uh, comments before we close out? Uh, no, I would I would encourage people to pursue category management. Uh, be curious, and thank you for your time. I appreciate uh, your interest. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Eric and Vail. Uh, that was a wonderful exposition uh, of the uh, importance of category management and procurement intelligence. Uh, we received uh, several interesting questions, but unfortunately, uh, we are out of time. We have run out of time. Uh, we will try and reply by email to all the questions that were not answered in today's session. Uh, this marks the end of our session. A big thank you to all the participants for logging in today. Again, a big thank you to all those who participated in the poll today. Uh, several of you had asked us, you know, whether we'll be sharing the webinar recording. Uh, yes, we will be sharing the webinar recording link uh, with all our participants soon. Uh, please do reach out uh, to the email uh, address on the screen if you have any additional questions. Like I said, a lot of you have voted. In case you would like to explore some of the senior folks who are currently attending this event, if you would like to explore category management at a strategic level, do drop us a note. We, we can help you out on that front also. Okay. Thank you and have a good day. And to all those in Asia, good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>